Hello, and welcome to our newscast on the BU News Service. I'm Daphne Mark. We begin today with news that affects the rollout of vaccinations. Center for Disease Control and Prevention Advisors are meeting today to decide whether to proceed with the single shot Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. The U.S. paused distribution yesterday out of an abundance of caution after receiving six reports of a rare and severe blood clot following vaccination. CNN's Britt Conway has more. From production to packaging to planes to patients, but now, less than two months later, pressing pause on the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine after reports of rare but severe blood clots. More than 6.8 million people in the U.S. have gotten the vaccine. Six reportedly developed blood clots. That's less than a one in a million rate. All women between the ages of 18 and 48 whose symptoms showed up within 13 days of being vaccinated. But there's no definitive link at this point. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Food and Drug Administration say a CDC panel will, quote, review these cases and assess their potential significance. The U.S. Surgeon General says the pause on J&J &J vaccines gives them time to work with doctors and nurses. We can enlist their help in looking for the kind of symptoms we may be concerned about. People experiencing a severe headache, abdominal pain, leg pain, or shortness of breath who've gotten the vaccine within the last three weeks should contact their doctor, the CDC says. Another reason for the pause? To do the investigation quickly, to understand whether there's a connection between the vaccine and the adverse events. If a connection is found, then the FDA and CDC may come out with recommendations that include warnings, for example, for certain populations that may be at increased risk. But that's what immunization experts from the CDC still need to figure out. And they're shooting to vote on updated recommendations on the vaccine by the end of the day. I'm Britt Conway reporting. According to the U.S. Surgeon General, even with the Johnson & Johnson pause, the U.S. has secured enough Moderna and Pfizer doses to vaccinate all U.S. adults by the end of July. The other two approved COVID-19 vaccinations are still being distributed. And in accordance with federal guidelines, Massachusetts pharmacies are temporarily halting the usage of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Major pharmacies such as CVS and Walgreens said they are canceling and rescheduling appointments using Moderna or Pfizer vaccines instead. The temporary halt of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is particularly affecting homebound residents since it is the only one-dose vaccine. Dr. Anthony Fauci said the reason for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine suspension was twofold, one being safety and the other to sound the alarm for doctors to look out for these blood clots. If there are women out there who have been vaccinated and who get this syndrome, this very serious syndrome, rare albeit, if they did, we wanted to make the doctors out there who know about this to make sure they treat the person correctly. The pause comes after six women have had blood clots within two weeks of the vaccine out of seven million doses administered. Due to a recent rise in coronavirus cases, Turkey announced that they are imposing a limited lockdown, coinciding with the beginning of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. The lockdown shifts the curfew from starting at 9 p.m. to 7 p.m. and goes to 5 a.m. During this time, inner city travel is banned except in emergencies. Only those between 18 and 75 are allowed to take public transit, and most children are to be in remote education starting April 15th. If the cases do not go down as a result of the lockdown, Turkey is prepared to enact stricter measures. A prosecutor is expected to decide today whether to charge a Minnesota police officer with the fatal shooting of 20-year-old Dante Wright. The expected decision comes after a third night of protests in the Minneapolis suburb, just several miles away from the murder trial of Derek Chauvin and the death of George Floyd last year. CNN's Nadia Romero has the latest in Minneapolis. Hundreds took to the streets for a third night of protest Tuesday over the police killing of Dante Wright. Initially peaceful, by nightfall, the tone of the crowd changed, with protesters throwing water bottles and other objects at officers, and officers firing pepper spray and flash bombs. Many arrests for riot and other uh, criminal behaviors. We have upwards of 60 arrests for people that will be booked into the Hennepin County Jail for various charges. Earlier Tuesday, the officer who shot Wright and the police chief both turned in letters of resignation. I'm hoping that 
this will help uh, bring some calm to uh, to the community. Although, uh, you know, I think ultimately people want justice. A charging decision could come Wednesday, the local prosecutor said. Meanwhile, just 10 miles away, the defense team for a former Minneapolis police officer had just begun presenting their case Tuesday. One of their first witnesses, a use of force expert, testifying that Derek Chauvin was justified in kneeling on George Floyd's neck for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. I felt that Officer Chauvin's interactions with Mr. Floyd were following his training, following current practices in policing, and were objectively reasonable. Another supporting the defense's theory that the crowd was distracting. They were uh, very aggressive, uh, aggressive towards the officers. I was concerned for the officer's safety. In Minneapolis, I'm Nadia Romero. Defense attorneys for Derek Chauvin are expected to continue to present witnesses today, the 13th day of the trial. Capitol Police knew the mob that stormed the Capitol on January 6th had plans to target Congress, but leaders told officers not to use their most aggressive tactics, the New York Times says. The Times reviewed a new report done by a Capitol Police internal investigator that says three days before the siege, police were warned of potential violence from Donald Trump supporters. But the day before the attack, the agency said there were no threats to Congress. A Capitol Hill hearing will take place Thursday to review the documents and findings. President Biden plans to remove all troops from Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. The pullout will end the United States' longest war. The Pentagon advised Biden to wait to withdraw troops until Afghan security forces can assert themselves against the Taliban. But Biden is making the move anyway. NATO is expected to do the same. An announcement from the White House should come sometime today. President Joe Biden is proposing a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin about the buildup of Russian troops along the border of Ukraine. Biden made the request during a phone call yesterday with Putin when he emphasized America's commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty. The White House press secretary spoke about the conversation. I think what we're working toward is predictable and stable. Uh, we're not we're not looking for uh, a, an establishment of trust as much as a predictability uh, and stability, uh, because there are a range of threats, there are a range of opportunities in the world, and the president wants to have the bandwidth to focus on them, not on an adversarial relationship with Russia. The Biden administration wants to hold the summit with Russia in a third country. The man behind one of the biggest Ponzi schemes died in prison today. Bertie Madoff passed away at the Prison Medical Center in Butner, North Carolina. Last year, Madoff told the Washington Post that he was suffering from a terminal kidney disease. Sources would only say that the disgraced financier died from natural causes. Bertie Madoff was 82 years old. Still to come, what does the new budget mean for Boston police? And will we hear about the effects of cutbacks on MBTA service? Those stories and more when we return. I don't remember how it started. Go to that. Our back and forth. It always came back. Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. I hear someone go, didn't it come from you guys? Strangers cough at me. Move away from me. Someone spit towards my direction. All the stereotypes that we've worked so hard to break are just going to be reversed. And I won't let that happen. We all have to play our part. I donate my plasma. I've been making masks. We deserve respect as much as everybody else. I'm a firefighter not a virus. I'm a mask maker, not a virus. I'm a nurse. I'm a delivery woman, a chef, a neighbor, artist, bus driver. I'm a doctor. Fight, Fight the virus. virus. Fight, Fight the virus. virus. Welcome back to our newscast. Today, Wednesday, Boston Mayor Kim Janey is scheduled to release her first proposed budget for the city. The $3.7 billion plan calls for cuts to police overtime, but adds 30 more officers to the Boston police force. The spending plan means the city's police department would receive $400 million this year, a cut of about $4 million. The mayor's office is required to propose the annual budget to the city council by mid-April. Recent MBTA budget cuts have left writers stranded, 
reduced commuter rail service, and even terminated several bus routes. BOTV 10's Justin Schmidthorst reports that public transit advocates are calling for changes. In March, the MBTA reduced or cut services to more train and bus lines and another round of budget cuts caused by the pandemic's decreased ridership. Losses this year are projected at $400 million. They are suspending weekend service to select commuter rail and bus routes and are eliminating 11 bus routes, along with reducing service in general. However, public transit advocates such as Jared Johnson of the organization Transit Matters have been critical of the new cuts. Uh, there are a number of riders that have been stranded, you know, um, for folks who, you know, work in service industry jobs, um, you know, say, uh, you know, on um, uh, along the commuter rail route, uh, they haven't had a work, they haven't had a, a route to work um, on weekends, um, you know, for folks who live in uh, the Fenway neighborhood, um, you know, particularly for seniors and folks with mobility challenges, um, you know, it's not as easy as I'll just walk a few blocks over. An example of this is senior Fenway resident Chris Colady, who normally rode bus route 55, which was terminated in March's round of cuts. I have multiple health problems and I have to uh, be in touch with my doctors at Mass General Hospital quite often. And now there's no 55 bus service. Things like my teeth are starting to rot out, my bones are starting to go, I can't walk very far. And um, it's just like really screwed up my whole life. MBTA General Manager Stephen Poftak said that if they have to bring back services, they will return them, although the timetable for that is unknown. From BUTV10, this is Justin Schmidhorst. The next MBTA budget meeting is scheduled for April 26th. It'll be virtual and open to the public. Police are still searching for a vehicle involved in a hit and run in Somerville. The white Ford Transit van struck 72-year-old Marshall Mack, a Vietnam War veteran and former prisoner of war. The victim's son, Pop Mac, is hoping the driver will do the right thing and turn themselves in. It's awful. I, just, I got no words for it. It's not humane. You, know, you hit someone, just come on and check to make sure they're okay. At least there, there was witnesses, you know, they called. Authorities are asking people to look out for a unique white Ford Transit van with long windows and a sunroof. We're tracking another incident in Marlboro, where a bicyclist collided with a truck. The rider is seriously injured and was taken by life flight to the UMass Memorial in Worcester. The accident remains under investigation. Investigators are blaming pilot error and maintenance issues for a deadly plane crash in Connecticut two years ago. Seven people were killed when a World War II era plane crashed at Bradley Airport outside of Hartford. Authorities just released a report saying that the plane had little room to maneuver after the pilot was forced to land. The Collings Foundation owned the historic plane and operated the flights. Coming up on our newscast, all the sports highlights and a look at the wet weather forecast. And we meet a chef combining making drinks and teaching online. Those stories and more when we continue. Hey chat. Why do I wear a mask? Because when I'm not behind the screen, my mask is my cheat code. And when we stop the spread, we level up. What's the next level? Hanging with friends again. You're right, masks have always been a part of our community. I miss you guys too. Being face-to-face -face is truly the next level. Here's the cheat code. Stop the spread of Corona. Mask up, America. When I first saw Turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with Turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. 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 Well, it looks like the sun is shining out there. Is the sun here to stay, Val? Everyone should go out and get their dose of vitamin D today, Daphne, because we're in for some cloudy weather starting tomorrow. We'll have crisp, sunny weather today, reaching the 50s in Boston, and even up to the 60s out in the western part of the state. But we can expect clouds on Thursday with showers starting in the late afternoon. You'll see temperatures drop this evening into the 30s and 40s as the rain intensifies overnight. 
This stormy weather is a function of the moisture coming from the south and will continue through Friday. We'll have winter storm watches out in the Berkshires and could see more than six inches of snow in the higher elevations. We can anticipate the weather to remain rainy and in the 50s all week before making way for some sunshine on Sunday, leading us into a sunnier and warmer week. Temperatures on Monday and Tuesday will be in the low to mid 60s. So be sure to get out there today, Daphne, and then take your umbrella with you the rest of the week. I have my umbrella ready, Val. I'm glad to see we'll have some better weather in time for the Patriots Day holiday on Monday. The island of St. Vincent is covered in gray mud after the volcano La Soufrière erupted. The eruption started on Friday for the first time in more than 40 years. The volcanic ash mixed with rain to cause the muddy conditions now covering the island. Tens of thousands of people have evacuated. There are no reported injuries, but efforts to shelter those who have fled has been complicated due to the coronavirus pandemic. The Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines says it could be four months before the danger of further eruptions subside. Two big unveilings took place in Tokyo as the Olympic Games are just around the corner. BU News Service's sports reporter Sierra Sorrentino has more. Sierra? Thanks, Daphne. We are 100 days out from the pandemic-delayed Tokyo Olympics. The ceremonial Olympic torch relay in Osaka was held in a park with no spectators due to the area's rise of new coronavirus cases. On Tuesday, Osaka reported over a thousand new cases. This is the region's highest daily surge since the start of the pandemic. The relay takes place at the same time of the unveiling of the 2020 Olympic mascots and the Olympic symbol monument at Mount Takao. Both mascots are fictional characters sporting blue and pink checkered designs and boasting superpowers such as teleportation. But Japan has seen a surge in COVID-19 infections as some areas are once again tightening restrictions. Officials say very few Japanese citizens have been vaccinated. The Celtics won the nail biter against the Portland Trailblazers, 116 to 115, extending their winning streak to four. Jason Tatum erupted for 32 points, sinking the divisive three with less than 10 seconds to go. Portland's Damian Lillard immediately answered with a three of his own, but the all-star point guard didn't have enough time to inspire a comeback. The Seas have lost only one game this month and are currently fifth in the Eastern Conference. Tatum starred for the Celtics on Tuesday while still battling long-term effects of the coronavirus. The forward revealed he started using an inhaler ahead of games after contracting the virus three months ago. Tatum said he's feeling better compared to last month and that he is very close to full recovery. The Bruins notched a hard-fought 3-2 win against the Buffalo Sabres in a shootout last night. Newcomer Taylor Hall almost chalked up his first assist in the Bruins jersey, but the referee ruled he didn't touch the puck before Craig Smith sent it home. In the end, a victory in his debut was all that mattered for the 2010 number one draft pick. Bruins goalie Tuka Rask, who has been dealing with an upper body injury since March, is hoping to return for the Thursday game against the New York Islanders. Restaurants have been struggling during the pandemic. In Boston, only six months into COVID-19, 37 prominent restaurants and bars permanently closed. Reporter Bart Tachi spoke with one of the local owners who is doing well, despite the virus. Maddie Dudek, she's in New York City. She owns a company called A Plate of Mind. This company teaches kids how to cook gourmet food and she has been crushing it. So we're making a spicy blood orange Paloma. Palomas are usually with grapefruit, but we're using blood orange today. It's gonna be so okay. good. So we need blood oranges. We need lime. We need a real big And ice. Look how pretty they are. It really makes- I cut it. Cool. Now do you squeeze the whole thing in? One whole lime. My <laughs> All right, now take it. And then just strain it right into your glass of ice. Cheers, Bart. Thanks so much. Cheers. Okay, now we can really get to the talking. As with most things in life, this was a bit of a winding road for Maddie. So she started out as a public school teacher in New York City. She did that for six years. Then she became a classically trained chef and worked at a high-end restaurant. And then she put those two passions together and started A Plate of Mind. The executive chef knew that I used to be a teacher and he had a friend whose daughter wanted cooking lessons. And at that time I was working the lunch shift. So I had afternoons free 
And he was like, oh, Maddie, you should see about teaching this girl, um, you know, once a week and maybe do like six weeks and send them like a lesson plan and see how it goes. And so that was my first client. And we kind of designed it so that I would go to her house and we would cook like dinner for her family. And I would teach her techniques and, you know, like restaurant techniques, like searing a duck breast and basting it. <laughs> like making it perfectly medium rare and she was like 11 but she wanted to learn that stuff kids are really advanced these days and it's because of like master chef and like all that stuff on tv and like youtube and everything she is available for online classes for adults as well as kids now um definitely check her out her website is a plate of mind.com thanks thanks bart some good news for restaurants Outdoor dining is back in Boston, just in time for the warm weather. And that's it for our BU News Service newscast. I'm Daphne Mark. Thanks for watching and have a great day.